good stuff. He's oh. content making for reviews, the first live streams on YouTube. It's, I'm, 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 I'm. Stay tuned at the end of this episode to find out how you can get tickets to see The Prince, a new theatre show coming to the Southwark Playhouse in London this September. Hello, my name's Abigail. Welcome to Philosophy Tube, a show about the book deepness. On tonight's episode, we're going to look at some true journey through the dark, seedy underbelly of Detroit Rock. Detroit property taxes in the early 2000s. For real, it is actually a class act. And quite dark. If you own a house, you've got to pay taxes on it every year. How much you pay depends on how much it's worth. A nice house would pay more often than an old home or less. Or at least, that's how it's supposed to be. But starting in 2009, the city of Detroit suddenly decided that a lot of old, run-down houses and poor neighborhoods, predominantly black neighborhoods, were actually worth loads of money and raised the property taxes on them by a huge amount. A lot of residents couldn't afford the new taxes, so they got their homes foreclosed on. About 100,000 homes in total. And obviously, this made them miserable, stressed, <laughs> Michigan has a law on the books that says authorities can't value a home for tax reasons. first exhibited in 1884, and I caused quite a stir in Paris, because although my artist intended for me to be a study in light and shade, the audiences and critics thought I was trying to be sexually provocative. So which is it? What does the art world mean? Now you might be sitting there thinking, well it's subjective, there's no right or wrong answer, but I am willing to bet. You don't really believe that. There's a big difference between saying that the quality of an artwork is subjective and the meaning is subjective. If you don't like the portrait of Madame X, then fair enough. I guess I'm not to everyone's taste. And I suppose when I pose for it, it's more like the portrait of Madame X. Why? But is it really the case that I can be about? If somebody says to you, I just saw Doctor Strange too, and you go, oh yeah, what's it about? And they say, it's about how love has an everlasting value, even between two people of different social classes on a doomed ocean. You'd be like, no, that's Titanic. It definitely seems like you can look at a work of art, think you know what it's about, and be wrong. Which means that meaning, at least, is not subjective. So assuming artworks do have objective meaning, how do we find out what the meaning is? If I don't get it, how do I get it? If you enjoyed today's episode and want to help me make more free educational material, hello, my name's Abigail. Welcome to my home and to Philosophy Tube, a show about ideas, a show that now has one million subscribers. I thought to celebrate, we could bake a cake and learn a little about a tasty subject, the philosophy of food. We're going to bake a lemon drizzle cake today. It's from Nigella Lawson, something light, sweet, and English. And she's made a recipe for lemon drizzle cake. But you know, 
You can only learn so much from books. I could probably use a hand, which is why I am delighted to welcome onto the show British TV legend and domestic herself, Nigella Mason. wasn't the real Nigella Lawson, and this is not my home. It's a production studio that I rented for the day. I live in a hole in the ground. Do not Hassan Piker me. I'm going to be as honest here as I can. I wrote quite a few drafts of this script, baking a cake and talking about the philosophy of food, and they were all fine. But about a week before filming, I realized that in every draft, the episode always ended when the cake was done. I never actually ate any of it. And My name's Abigail. Welcome to Philosophy Tube, a show about ideas. At time of recording, the Canadian Senate is considering a bill that, on the face of it, doesn't seem too major. Bill S233 calls for the government to establish a framework for studying the possibility of a universal basic income program in Canada. So, not doing something not planning to do something, just establishing a framework to study the possibility of maybe doing something someday in Canada. However, the Canadian Senate has been inundated with tens of thousands of calls, emails, and handwritten letters from people saying this is the beginning of the world. People are falsely claiming that this is the first step in a global socialist takeover, or they're going to use it to deny pensions to unvaccinated people, or that they're going to use it to unleash. Stamming with faint praise. <laughs> no, what are you talking about? This is the future now, whether we like it or not, actually. Dystopian as it may well be. Um, no, I mean, you're not just a YouTuber. You're an actor. You're, a, you're so many things. We'll talk about it. I just want to start. I mean, let's just start. I mean, I mean, you must be like, oh, oh roll eyes. Do we really have to keep talking about this? But, you know, I find it interesting from one side of the LGBTQ rainbow. Um, because coming out as a cisgendered, for those who don't know, that means trans, my gender ally, the gender assigned to me at birth is the gender which I feel comfortable. They got it right. They were right first time. They nailed it. They nailed it. Um, yeah. Is, exactly. I have to quibble with that one. But uh, coming out as gay was stressful, but I, did, I only had to come out at the time to my friends, my family. It was so stressful. Coming out as trans in the current climate to the world that's mm -hmm. a much bigger deal. So do you just want to talk me through that and the kind of build up to it and what your, I don't know, what was your fears, what would go through your head? Well, I I had two comings out really because I had, um, I had my private coming out to my family and my friends, which happened a long, long time before I came out publicly. 
so that was uh, very stressful and uh, and very 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 typical. It's kind of followed the typical model of a lot of a lot of trans people coming out privately, um, and then uh, having to navigate various sort of legal and uh, medical obstacles as well. And then much later, I had my coming out publicly because for those who uh, don't know me already, uh, I'm an actress and I'm a YouTuber. My show is called Philosophy Chew, and it has about 900,000 subscribers at the moment. Um, and I've been doing that for a few years. I teach philosophy in a fun way. Uh, and I, I started it when the government tripled tuition fees because I just wanted to give away my philosophy degree. And it, it became this sort of huge thing. So I had the to have the feature get conferred onto them a social status. Consciously. The other properties in the mammal cluster, that if you want to win the science game, you've got to classify them as mammals on Earth. Everybody loved him. Unfortunately, some of others thought they belonged in a category all their own until they realized they had so many of the other properties in the mammal cluster that if you want to win the science game, you've got to classify them as mammals. On Earth Zero, there are no mammals. They know about warm blooded animals, yeah. But mammal is a social construct that we use to keep track of certain underlying properties. And on Earth Zero, they play the science game differently, so they don't use that social construct. On Earth Negative One, they don't even have the underlying properties. They're all just like... These... Remember earlier on, I was talking about how the high school community confers the property of coolness on you? Or the scientific community conferred the property of mammal on the platypus? What if communities disagree? What if someone was like, actually, the only important thing for deciding whether an animal is a mammal is whether it lays eggs? What if the anime club think that you're really cool but the Quidditch team don't. Are you cool? Or not? Ashta says, there is literally no answer to that. There are underlying properties about you, but the social property of coolness and what exactly is in the cluster we're attempting to track depends on the game we're trying to play, which might not matter so much for being cool, but there could be some other social properties where it might really affect your life if somebody refused to confer them on you. We've been talking today about baseball and platypuses, but obviously what we're really talking about is sex and race and gender and all that good stuff. When I wrote the script, I deliberately went a bit more abstract with it because sometimes when we talk about social constructs, people get really angry. Like, remember earlier on, I talked about social constructs being full VR rather than augmented reality? That was a reference to a philosopher called Judith Butler. They wrote a famous book in the 90s called Gender Trouble in which they argued that sex is a social construct as opposed to a biological natural property. It's a pretty fascinating book. It spawned a lot of interesting philosophy. Maybe we could talk about it in detail another time. But people get so angry about it. Even today, people protest Judith Butler, which is wild. I mean, nobody ever protested Socrates. Everybody loved him. Unfortunately, some of the people who get angry about social constructs aren't really making a philosophical argument so much as they are trying to rationalize a dislike of trans people. Especially in my country, the debate about who does and does not have the property being a woman or being a man isn't really about metaphysics it's just a kind of proxy way of deciding whether people like me get health care and human rights which is a shame i mean 
I think this philosophy is kind of interesting on its own. I wish we could talk about it without that. I said up top that social constructs are built into our environment, and the way we think about our environment facilitates different kinds of engagement with it. For instance, say you take your car in to have the airbags replaced after they've gone off, and the mechanic says, why did the airbags go off? And you say, well, an onboard sensor measured a deceleration of greater than average braking speed, and that sent an electrical current along a circuit to a heating element, triggering a chemical reaction, releasing nitrogen gas. The mechanic might say, okay, but why did the airbags go off? And you say, I had 19 pints and crashed into a wall. If you give that first explanation about sensors and nitrogen, well, then I guess we just have to fit another airbag. But if you give the second explanation about drunk driving, well, now we need to talk about your insurance. Depending on how you explain the problem, different solutions present themselves. When we talk about social constructs, the implication is that the constructs aren't fixed. We could change the stuff that we projected onto the world if we wanted to. At the very least, we could ask, why are we projecting this stuff? Whose interests does it serve? There's an inherent possibility of changing society here which is therefore inherently political, and that can be pretty scary. For instance, consider that the gay rights movement in my country leant hard on the idea of born this way. The idea that homosexuality is innate and therefore can't be right or wrong. We can imagine that on Earth 3, they made a different argument. More like, uh, whether it's innate or not, it's not the government's business. Like a, like a personal freedom line. I'm not saying either approach is better, I'm just saying we can imagine a world in which the meaning of gay is socially constructed differently. But if you say to a gay person, hey, you know homosexuality? That's just a social construct. We might be like, whoa, what are you saying? Because the concept of gay rights is built on top of it. So it's worth remembering that we aren't really talking about baseball and bonuses. We're talking about people. And therefore, questions of justice arise in how we should apply this metaphysics. If Ashta is right, and man and woman are socially constructed categories that we apply in order to track some underlying cluster of natural properties, we might then ask, if we're playing the justice game, what should be in that cluster? And separate but related question, what should the law say about it? I deliberately chose non-controversial examples to help you get a grasp of the metaphysics without getting bogged down in questions of justice or pushing my own views. But it's worth remembering that that is an artificial separation. When you leave the classroom, politics and metaphysics will come at you at the same time. <coughs> for the hell of it, we are tinkering with the engine of the world here. So drive. I don't wanna feel this good just cause you called last night. I'm not that girl. I don't wanna love you and be a toy. I'm not that girl. No, I'm not that girl. I don't wanna feel this good just cause you called last night. Achilles wrath to Greece, the direful spring of woes unnumbered. Heavenly goddess, sing. That wrath which hurled to Hades gloomy rain the souls of heroes too untimely slain. Declare, O oh muse, in what ill-fated hour sprung that fierce strife from what offended power. In 2016, 4,000 environmentalists in Germany shut down a coal mine. Germany has a lot of coal mines. In fact, they account for seven of the ten biggest CO2 emitters in Europe. So activists from the Endigelande movement blockaded the Garswele mine and the power station next door to it, which is called... <laughs> which is called... Swarge Pump. 
think I saw Swarj Poon performing at Harpies last week. They broke down a few fences and sprayed <coughs> some Suddenly, they just stood in the way of the machinery and shut the plant down for two days. Good evening. Welcome to Philosophy Tube. Tonight's performance features a famous judge, the works of Franz Kafka, a deranged horse, and an illegal pudding. But before the show begins, I'd like to say that at no point during tonight's play am I going to criticize Amy Coney Barrett for being religious, for being anti-feminist, or even for being conservative. On the contrary, I'm going to try and be as neutral as I possibly can and explore her ideas on their own merits. I think she poses interesting questions, not just for Americans, but for everyone. At time of recording, Barrett has just been confirmed as a super... Hello, my name's Abigail. Over the last few years, I have emailed Britain's national health care provider 133 times trying to get a doctor's appointment. This video is about what that was like, why big institutions fall apart, and why they're so difficult to change. As research, I've spoken to some of the NHS's most senior administrators, so over the course of this rational analysis, I'll be revealing some exclusive insider information. The video is sponsored by Nebula, but after I've paid back the owner of this laptop, I'll be donating most of that money to charity. <laughs> Here's how things are supposed to work. British citizens of all ages have a right to free health care on the National Health Service or NHS. I was born in the NHS and both my parents were doctors. My dad used to say when I was a kid that he treated everyone from all walks of life, from literal aristocrats to prisoners from the local jail, because the point of the serve is that it's there for everyone. Since its creation in 1948, the NHS has become a symbol of the country that a lot of British people are very proud of, like the Royal Family or William Shakespeare or Beans on Toast. The NHS is split into several regional bodies called trusts, like there's a Cambridge Trust and an Oxford Trust and an East London Trust and a West London Trust and so on. They get money from the government, which they spend on healthcare services like staffing, equipment and supplies, and they give that to patients for free. In this way, the NHS is funded mainly by the taxpayer. But even if you don't make enough money to pay taxes, you can still use it because again, the point of the service is that it's there for everyone, which it definitely, definitely is, as well as the right to use the NHS. We also have the right to begin treatment within 18 weeks of referral and that right to free medical treatment within 18 weeks includes free medical transition for transgender people of all ages. If you didn't already know, that includes me. I'm a trans woman. And we'll be using the NHS's treatment of me as our case study for today, which will reveal some more general things about how the service is run and the challenges that it's facing in the 21st century. If you want to medically transition in England, then you can start by going to your local family doctor. In Britain, we call this person a general practitioner or GP. Your GP will send you to a gender identity clinic where you'll be assessed by specialists to see if you fit the criteria for gender dysphoria, a diagnosis that is definitely real and which definitely makes a lot of sense. If you are diagnosed with dysphoria, then they'll let you use other bits of the NHS. For example, if you want surgery, they'll send you to a surgeon. If you want hormones, they'll tell your GP to prescribe hormones for you, which your GP definitely will. Once you're in the medical system, you can also change the legal sex that is recorded on your birth certificate and your passport. In England, 
you cannot change either of those things without first obtaining a doctor's permission. But it all starts with a friendly visit to your local NHS doc, who will be only too happy to provide you with world-class medical care from the finest system in the world. Several years ago, I went to my GP, told her I'm trans, and asked to be referred to a gender identity clinic. The first thing she did was refuse. I'm not exactly off to a great start. I won't name her, or any of the real people I'll be referring to today. Instead, I'll call her Lieutenant Scheisskopf. Scheisskopf told me to come back in a month and said that if I was still trans then, she would refer me. GPs in England aren't routinely trained in trans medicine, hence the separate clinics. So the idea that you're supposed to wait a month before you can go, she made that up on the spot. She also tried to send me to mental health services, which wasn't what I was there for. She only had one job, send me to the gender clinic. But for some reason, she wouldn't do it. I am not the only patient who fell at the first hurdle. This is a 2013 NHS report titled Monitoring and Promoting Trans Health Across the Northwest. The authors investigated the needs of trans patients across Northwest England and how GPs were meeting those needs, or rather they tried to, but they couldn't, because GPs overwhelmingly refused to cooperate with the researchers. Only half of the practices they investigated even replied, and that was just the beginning. It was extremely difficult to get beyond reception staff to speak to practice managers. For example, the researcher was told many times that the practice manager was not in, but would be later, only to be told later that they were on leave or did not work in the afternoons. Very few practice managers understood what was meant by transgender people and were unwilling to engage in this research. Some practice managers, receptionists and GPs who were spoken to expressed particularly negative attitudes towards trans people. This study clearly demonstrates that most GP practices are not sufficiently prepared or knowledgeable to appropriately address the needs of this patient group. 2013 was almost a decade ago, but more recent data and my own experience confirms this is still a problem. This 2015 NHS report, which solicited feedback from patients and staff, also highlighted uncooperative GPs as a major problem. This 2016 article in the British Medical Journal says the same thing. In 2021, the non-profit Trans Actual ran a survey which included questions about healthcare. 14% of trans respondents said that their GPs, like mine, simply refused to help them. That's more than one in ten. As my friend Alice is fond of saying, the NHS is a wonderful institution. Unfortunately, it is run by the brain.
but I didn't have any other choice. So I went away for a month as ordered. And 30 days later, surprise, surprise, I was still transgender. So I went back to Lieutenant Shryskoff a second time. And this time she said she would refer me. Six months went by. I remind you that we have the right to be treated within 18 weeks. So at this point, I've already waited double that and I'm not even in the door. But after six months, I still hadn't even gotten so much as a letter from the clinic saying I was in the system. So I went back to Shyskop a third time. And this time she said, oh, the letter's still here. I must have forgotten to sign it. Dismiss, Captain. I said dismiss, Captain, get the hell out of my office. The lesson I took from this was that my doctor was either so incompetent she couldn't work a post box, or more likely, she didn't want to give me medical care. Neither of which is great, to be honest. Honestly, you think you're on good terms with someone and then you come out as trans and suddenly they don't want anything to do with you anymore. In a lot of ways, the NHS is just like my dad. i uh, just like to clarify that that was a joke. I have a normal and happy relationship with my father, who is a very supportive and loving man. At this point, I moved to a different area of the country and signed up with a new GP. And I went along and I asked to be sent to the gender clinic. But this time, I printed out the NHS rules on treating trans patients and highlighted the relevant sections. So when he said, I'm sorry, I can't send you to the clinic, I pulled them out and I said, actually, doctor, you not only can, you are required to. After a great deal of persuasion, he did in fact agree to follow the rules and he referred me to the clinic. I made sure to get a signed and dated copy of that referral. And the clock officially started. I waited 18 weeks. I waited 18 more weeks. And then I waited 18 more weeks. There are currently seven gender clinics for adults operating in England. None of them are seeing patients within the required 18 week limit and waiting lists are extremely long. How long you ask? Well, at time of recording, the largest clinic in London has 11,407 patients on its waiting list. Last month, they offered first appointments to 50. That means that if you were referred today, you will be waiting for 19 years. And that's not 19 years for healthcare either. That's 19 years for a first appointment, of which you may have several with months or even years between them. You might be wondering, wow, only 50? Maybe they had a really slow month last month. Maybe that's throwing the numbers off. Nope, 50 is pretty typical. That's actually better than it used to be. When I was referred, it was 26 years. The long waiting times contribute to high levels of distress among trans patients. It also impacts our access to civil rights like marriage, death, and privacy. Because remember, in England, if you want to change the sex marker on your birth certificate or passport, you need a doctor's permission. If you haven't changed the marker on your passport, for instance, because you're on a years long waiting list to get permission, then every time you apply to rent a flat or get a job, you'll have to show them your passport and they'll instantly know you're trans. Employers and landlords are not allowed to discriminate. Ha, 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 ha. Long waiting times are an especially acute problem when it comes to trans children. If you know that you're trans at a young age and you're forced to go through the wrong puberty, it can be very distressing. And it can cause, dare I say it, irreversible damage, or not really damage, but it has permanent effects. For instance, I went through a testosterone puberty as an adolescent, and as a result, I'm taller than the average English woman. Also, I can do this with my voice whenever I want to. <laughs> I mean, I think those things are positives about me because I really like being tall. And also it's useful as an actress to have two voices and 
a perfect impersonation of Matt Berry on tap. <laughs> there are other effects that are negative and also permanent. So it's especially important that trans children get prompt treatment. If you're 13 and trans, and there's a years long wait to get care, then by the time you're seen, it could be too late. And your life is not over if that happens to you, but it will shape the rest of your time on earth. And that's what a lot of this comes down to, waiting for somebody else's permission to live the rest of your life. Faced with these waiting lists, a lot of trans people do one of three things. Option one is private health care. Obviously, that's very expensive. So it tends to be the more privileged, usually white trans people who get to do that. And even if you can't afford it, that's money that you can't spend on a holiday or a house or a wedding, or it means you go into a lot of debt. Option two is self-medication. That means buying hormones off the internet or sharing them with a friend. I found a 2016 article in The Lancet which records that 40% of adult patients who get an appointment at the London clinic are already self-medicating when they arrive. If that rate holds constant across the nation, that would mean there are tens of thousands of people doing it, although because it's underground, who knows? Anecdotally, every British trans person I know, except for two, I think, is either self-medicating or has at some point. If you're a trans woman like me, then self-medicating in England is legal. You need a testosterone blocker and estrogen, and you can order both of those from a foreign country without a prescription on the internet and have them sent here. If you have them, it's also legal to share them with a friend who needs them. However, if you're a trans man, then things are a little trickier because you're gonna need testosterone and it's illegal to sell or share that. The government doesn't want trans guys getting too yoked. Rishi Sunak's a short king. He doesn't want to be intimidated by all these trans dudes walking around getting buff. But obviously, taking pills that you bought on the internet can be very medically risky. GPs are supposed to help people who do, though again, some simply refuse. There is a large and growing network of people in the trans underground who help each other out, although mindful as I am of YouTube's community guidelines, I can't tell you how to self-medicate. And please note, I'm also explicitly not saying that I recommend it. I'm just saying it is a fact that a lot of people do, probably because they find that option more palatable than option three. Option three is that you die. And people do die on the waiting lists. Every year at Trans Pride, there are more names read out of the people who aren't here anymore. There was a recent death in the community of a woman who'd waited more than a thousand days on the waiting list. I've had parents of trans children email me about the kids that they've lost. I'm going to be honest with you, writing this episode of Philosophy Tube has been a struggle because the show is about being compassionate and seeing all sides. But as a human being, I have a strong preference for my own survival and a strong emotional reaction when I see other people needlessly suffering. What I'm saying is this episode might get a little bit more personal than usual because now I need to tell you about what I did next. Having waited much, much longer than the legal maximum waiting time, I decided to start sending some emails. I found out which trust runs the gender clinic I'd been referred to, and I wrote to someone on their board of directors, a man I'll be referring to as Major de Coverley. Major de Coverley is the trust's head of compliance. It's his job to make sure that they're following all the rules. He's not a doctor, and actually that's worth bearing in mind. The NHS is not administered by doctors. It's administered by administrators. I wrote to Major de Coverley every week for several months, and eventually he wrote back. Dear Abigail, as you've noted in your email, we are unable to offer a first appointment with the 18-week time frame that operates for most NHS services. 
Although this 18-week recommendation does, in principle, apply to our service, we and all the other gender services nationally are unable to meet this target currently due to very high demand. Here I can bring in one of our big philosophers for today, Sarah Ahmed, and her book Complaint, which is all about how making complaints to institutions reveals the way they really work. In his letter to me, Major de Coverley was using a very interesting technique from management and business philosophy, a technique called lying. The 18-week time limit is not a recommendation or a target that applies in principle. It's actually a right. I pointed this out, politely, of course, and his next move seemed a little better. If you would like to discuss any aspect of your complaint further, please do let me know and I will arrange for you to speak to a senior member of the Gender Identity Clinic. That sounded like progress, talking to the guy who runs the clinic. If anyone can get me an appointment, he surely can, so we arranged a meeting. He picked the time and place. I waited for over an hour and he never turned up. I honestly cannot stress enough to you how absolutely f***ing sh** all these people are at scheduling. They miss emails. They forget to press send when they write their replies. Multiple times we've arranged meetings. They chose the time and place and then they just never turned up. Trying to reach them is like attempting the impossible. All these little mistakes get made, but they're always mistakes that benefit the institution, never the person complaining. And for this reason, Sarah Ahmed coins the term strategic inefficiency. The harder it is to complain, the fewer complaints they have to deal with, the more they can just carry on doing what they're doing. She also says that making a complaint becomes a kind of unpaid job because in order to complain about a system, you have to spend a lot of time learning about how it's supposed to work. I don't think I can adequately explain to you just how maddening it is to go through all that organization now and then when you finally get into the meeting, they don't know the rules that they're supposed to be following. So often in this process, I have wanted to say to these people, why am I doing your job? Just dozens and dozens and dozens of emails, hundreds of hours spent doing this in my free time just to get an appointment with a doctor and so that I can turn it into educational content for all of you fine people. Patreon.com slash philosophy tube. I am no longer asking, sign the f up. Exhaustion can become a management technique. So much of the work of complaint is work we would not have to do if institutions were as committed to creating open, accessible and inclusive environments as they claim to be. Eventually, I managed to reschedule that meeting, and I came face to face with a man who actually runs a gender identity clinic. I'll call him Major Major. He's not a doctor, but he sat there and he nodded and listened sympathetically as I explained I'd been waiting for longer than the legal maximum waiting time, and I'd like my appointment now, please. He told me the exact same thing Major DeCoverley had. They aren't working within the 18-week time limit, and they aren't going to. I, I don't understand exactly what it is that you think I can do. You're a major. You're major, 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 major. You can just sign things. Sign what? The form. What form? After several weeks of back and forth, it dawned on me that Major de Coverley had arranged this meeting not to actually solve the problem, but to try and get rid of me. Arm says institutions handle complaints using non-performative speech. In philosophy, performative speech is when you say something and by saying it, you also do it. Like when you say, I promise, you're speaking, but you're also doing the act of promising. Or if you're at a straight wedding and the officiant says, I now pronounce you man and wife. They're saying it and they're doing it. On the flip side, non-performative speech is when you say something and by saying it, you prevent it from being done. Like, we are listening to feedback. We take your concerns very seriously. Non-performative speech is how an institution can appear to be doing something about a problem whilst actually very deliberately doing nothing. Major Major supplied a top tier example when he said that whilst the waiting times are bad, we are working hard to improve the quality of wait. 
I said, that's like telling me you're going to keep kicking me in the face, but you're working hard to put on softer shoes. I pointed out that by failing to treat patients within the required time, some of whom died, the clinic was doing a great deal of harm to trans people. And at this point, Major Major got upset. He said, I'm a black gay man. I'm a trans ally. I have trans friends. I'm on your side here. Which was very interesting because we'd been talking about the failures of the clinic. But he substituted the clinic for himself as a person. He took my complaints about the failures of the system as an attack on his character. And in so doing, he made the conversation about his feelings rather than the failures that he's responsible for and how he's going to fix them. This is also a management technique that Ahmed and others have identified. The scholar Manta Akapadi talks about her experiences trying to criticize university departments for institutional racism. And she found that when she raised this problem, the white women in charge of the university departments often cried because they thought they were being called racist. Their hurt feelings then become the problem. And the real problem, the institutional racism, never got addressed. Open your eyes, Clevenger. It doesn't make a damn bit of difference who wins the war to someone who's dead. Congratulations. I can't think of another attitude that can be depended upon to get greater comfort than the enemy. and health service ombudsman, which I guess in this example would be like the military police. They're an independent body who is supposed to investigate the NHS when things go wrong. So I made a formal complaint to them and they told me that they would assign an investigator within eight weeks. 16 weeks later, they did. A man I'll be referring to as Chaplain Tapman. Chaplain Tapman was honestly the only person I spoke to in this whole journey who was the least bit sympathetic. He asked me how my experiences had made me feel about Major de Coverley and Major Major, and I quoted Moby Dick to him, which we both found very funny. Chaplain, insanity is contagious. Everybody's crazy except for us. You and I have to be careful. We may be the only sane people in the entire world. However, after several more months of waiting for him to investigate, he told me his superiors had ordered him to drop the case. I apologize for this negative outcome. One thing I was surprised to hear from Chapman Tapman, though, was that there were other cases that he was also being ordered to drop. It honestly hadn't occurred to me before that anyone else might have taken it as far as I had. Ahmed talks about how official complaints procedures can be individualizing, which kind of just means lonely. The NHS has no way for a group of people to complain together about the same problem. You have to do it alone and bear the cost on your time and your emotions alone too, which is another way of discouraging you from trying. I guess if somebody really wanted to, they could put together a kind of collective complaint. Like they could get together with some friends and go down to NHS England's offices, maybe with some signs and placards and a microphone. So I did together with a bunch of activists from a group called Transgender Action Block, I attended a protest outside NHS England's offices. There were hundreds of us who'd all just been denied healthcare, some of whom had been left in pain between surgeries, some of, some of whom had lost friends and relatives. But it still didn't get me an appointment. NHS England never even publicly acknowledged that protest took place. I cried on the phone to Chaplain Tapman. I asked, is there anyone else I can possibly appeal to besides God? <laughs> and he said, I'm not aware of there being a higher authority.
is wrong. There is a higher authority. There is. And after a few more months of emailing, I found him, the man behind the man. Who gives the orders? Colonel Cathcart. Colonel Cathcart is the head of NHS England's specialised commissioning. He tells the trusts how they have to handle medical transition. He can't act on his own, but everyone I spoke to told me he's the guy. And when I emailed the CEO of the NHS herself, she also passed me back down to him. I'm Colonel Cathcart, and as of now, I'm in charge of a sorry-ass bunch of homosexuals. By the way, a lot of these people's emails aren't publicly listed, and it was kind of fun to go hunting for them. I managed to get in touch with the CEO of the NHS by getting her old workplace email off LinkedIn, emailing that, and getting an automatic out-of-office reply saying, hey, I'm leaving this job now to go and run the NHS. If you need me, here's my address. And I was like, yes, I'm in. I told Colonel Cathcart I had been waiting for much, much longer than the legal maximum waiting time, and I would like to have my appointment. He told me to take it up with Major Major and Major Decoupley, and I said, Colonel. But, uh, they've already sent me to you. And then he told me the reason for the delays was because GPs are uncooperative. The very problem I'd encountered at the start. He told me that everyone wants to change the system and make it faster, but they can't because GPs won't let them. The GPs are scared, he told me, and one of the sent me this. This document is from 2019. It was published by the Royal College of GPs. It's titled, The Role of the GP in Caring for Gender Questioning and Transgender Patients. They really need a more exciting name. In it, the Royal College acknowledges that GPs get no training in trans healthcare and that trans patients sometimes have bad experiences. So they recommend more resources in the system and more training. And that's basically it. There's nothing in here to support Cathcart's claim that GPs are the ones standing in the way of changing the system. In fact, it seems to me that when you actually read this document, they acknowledge several reasons why the system should change. It's even weirder, too, that they send me this, given that it makes a bunch of recommendations from 2019, and none of them have actually happened. So why send me this, as if it explains or solves anything? But then I remembered some more philosophy from Sarah Ahmed. She talks about how documents become tools of institutional performance. They don't really exist in order to be read. They exist to give the institution a good image. An example might be anti-bullying policies. Your workplace probably has one. And Ahmed talks about how when she encountered bullying in her workplace, she reported it to management, and they sent her a copy of the policy. Even because they defended the bullies. Documents create fantasy images of the organizations they apparently describe. The document says we are diverse, as if saying it makes it so. Many practitioners and academics have expressed concerns that writing documents or having good policies becomes a substitute for action. As one of my interviewees puts it, you end up doing the document rather than doing the doing. Furthermore, the orientation to writing good documents can block action insofar as the document then gets taken up as evidence that we have done it. Colonel Cathcart was just doing the same thing Major DeCoverley had, trying to get rid of me, except instead of using a meeting, he was using a piece of paper. But since he tried to shift the blame to the Royal College of GPs, you know what I did next. Oh, I had to do it to him. I emailed the Royal College of GPs. And after doing that every week for several months, they let me speak to one of their guys, a guy I'll call Major Danby. I actually asked Major Danby outright, is it true what Colonel Cathcart said? Is it true that GPs are the reason behind all of this? And he said, oh, no, no, no. It's the British Medical Association's fault. So I emailed them too. I'm not giving up. This is my white whale. That's right, motherfuckers. I was assigned hater at birth. They told me it was Colonel Cathcart's fault. At this point, I was feeling very calm, very normal. Joker makeup was bursting out of my pores. I was turning into a giant insect, falling down an infinitely repeating staircase. Things of this nature. I couldn't understand them. We have the right to be seen within 18 weeks. I'd waited at this point over a year. Just what the heck is going wrong with the NHS? 
Now, I bet that some of you are sitting there thinking, oh, that sucks. But what do you expect? The NHS is in crisis. And you are absolutely right. To show you just how right you are, I'd like to take a moment now to calmly, impartially, explore exactly why the NHS is in crisis. It is true that the situation is pretty dire for everyone right now. There are over 7 million people in England on some kind of waiting list for NHS care. The majority of maternity units in England no longer meet safety standards. There are parts of England where they wait for several hours just to get an ambulance and public satisfaction with the NHS. There are regional inequalities too. The healthcare that you get in Newcastle, where I'm from, might be of a very different standard to the healthcare you get in Sunderland, just one city over. And that sucks because as much as it pains me to say it, the people of Sunderland do deserve to live. Obviously on the condition that they renounce their football team. Things are certainly a mess, but on the other hand, being impartial, I'm sure the health secretary has a plan to fix it. Whoever that is this week. Depending on who you ask, there are different explanations for all this mess. According to the government, things were pretty okay, but then COVID came along. And it's true that COVID did not help. The pandemic swallowed up a lot of the NHS's capacity, still is, and a lot of frontline healthcare workers burned out or had to be retasked or just died. According to people who don't like Brexit, Brexit caused a staff shortage. And it's true that that probably didn't help either, because a lot of NHS staff were from the EU. Emphasis on were. Now that we've left, it is easier for them to go elsewhere, because European citizens have freedom of movement. If you're a doctor in France and you want to work abroad, you could fill out a whole bunch of forms and pay a bunch of money to go to England, or you could go to the Netherlands for free where you've got more rights and the pay is better. And also they have double-decker trains in the Netherlands, which is really cool. We're having to recruit more medical staff from outside the EU now to make up for the Brexit shortfall, which is happening, but it does take a little bit of time. However, we should also bear in mind that this snowball has been rolling for a while. For the last decade and change, there's been a lot of cuts to public services. And when you slash budgets, not as much stuff can be done. Things run, understaffed, overworked, underpaid, people burn out, new people are hard to find. Anecdotally, almost every doctor I know is planning to move to New Zealand. There was already a staffing crisis in the NHS before Brexit or COVID, and the capacity was already falling too. Remember earlier I said there are 7 million people in England on some kind of NHS waiting list? Well, before the pandemic, that number was only 4.5 million, so... I think the ship had a few holes in before we even hit the iceberg, Captain. The NHS has also been massively impacted by cuts to local government, because in England, local government handles social care. For example, let's say that you're an older person and you have a knee replacement in an NHS hospital. After a few days, you're well enough to go home, but you need a social worker to go and get groceries for you or to just pop in and check on you every now and again whilst you continue recovery. Well, the bad news is there aren't enough social workers. There aren't even enough people to process your application for a social worker because budget cuts. It's sick to stay in hospital, but you're not really well enough to go home on your own, so you just kind of sit there like a lemon. There are a lot of people sitting around in hospital beds who don't need to be there, but you can't be discharged because they've got nowhere they can go. And that means that new people can't come in. These cuts are also very difficult to row back on. One way that a trust can make up a shortfall in its budget is by selling its assets off to private developers. And once a piece of the health service is owned by an American private equity firm or a Chinese investment group, they ain't gonna wanna give it back. If a job like nursing, for instance, just doesn't pay enough for people to live on, then that creates massive recruitment problems that are very difficult to get around. On the other hand, being impartial, I'm sure that over a decade of all these cuts, but the economy is in shape. We all just stand to Isn't it understandable that things are 
criticise the NHS, even ungrateful? Wouldn't it play right into the hands of the people who want to privatise it? That's definitely an argument that some people make, and I'm being calm and rational and impartial, so I'm not going to say no, but I am very strongly going to say yes and my GP didn't refuse to help me because they didn't have the money. It would have cost her nothing to actually do her job. The 2013 and 2015 investigations into trans healthcare didn't find problems of budget. They found problems of bigotry. Also in 2015, the Women and Equality Select Committee issued a report on the state of trans healthcare, which again identified prejudice as a major obstacle. And we aren't the only minority that gets hit by it, unfortunately. Remember earlier I said that the majority of maternity units in England don't meet safety standards? Well, black women are four times as likely to die in childbirth than white women. Oh, and if you're trans and a person of colour, that's a double whammy. Pretty much all of these reports also say that getting trans health care is even more difficult if you aren't white. Although they never say it in those terms. They're always like, this report identifies inconsistencies in the treatment of transgender patients of color whose needs are not always consistently being met by the health service and it's like guys if you just called it racism think how much money you'd save on printering i'm not saying that everyone who works in the nhs is a frothing bigot i'm just saying it is a fact that the nhs admits not all the problems are caused by a lack of funding and with that in mind I'd like to take a closer look now at how the trans healthcare system is actually designed. Let's say, for the sake of argument, that you are a transgender woman and you want to get an orchidectomy. That's an operation to remove your testicles. In the USA, they say orchidectomy, but here we say orchidectomy because the whole point is that you keep the D. A trans woman in England who wants that operation has to first get an appointment at the gender clinic, then be diagnosed with gender dysphoria, then be on hormone replacement therapy for a certain amount of time, and then she needs two separate psychiatric assessments. In contrast, a cisgender man, that is a man who is not transgender, who has chronic scrotal pain and wants the same operation, can be sent straight to a surgeon from his GP. It's not like it's a difficult procedure either. It's just like getting your tonsils out, except they do it at the other end. And the same is true across the board. A cisgender woman with chronic uterine bleeding who wants a hysterectomy, that's the removal of the womb, can be referred to a surgeon from her GP. A transgender man who wants the same operation from the same surgeon has to go through all those extra steps. A cisgender woman who wants to take estrogen for menopause can get it from her GP. In fact, pretty soon, she'll be able to buy it from a pharmacy. A trans woman who wants the same medicine has to go to the gender clinic and be diagnosed with dysphoria first. This is the one that really gets me. If a cisgender man is worried about going bald, he can get testosterone blockers from his GP. But we can't. This isn't how other countries do it. The president of the World Professional Association of Transgender Health called the British system outdated and inefficient in 2021. In Canada, parts of the USA and Argentina, you can start medical transition a lot easier by just going to a GP. That's A space GP, not a GP. And this system is very unpopular with patients too. Speaking only for myself, I find it a little bit irritating that I have to go to a separate clinic to get the same medicine as everyone else. I mean, even if I could go on the same day and there was no waiting list, why do I have to? More on that later. Speaking not just for myself, in 2018, the NHS ran a consultation in which they asked patients what we wanted to change about the system. In 2015, the Women and Equality Select Committee also asked both reports clearly record the patient's desires for an informed consent system, one in which we don't need to get a doctor's permission to transition, but we can just get our health care the same way everyone else does. In 2013, that GP report that I mentioned earlier also recommended an informed consent system. 
Surprise, surprise, systems like that are associated with higher patient satisfaction. And it would save the NHS a huge amount of money. Running these separate clinics has massive costs for staffing and training and computers. If they just gave us healthcare the same way cis people get, the way other countries do, the way we've been asking for years, it would genuinely save the NHS a lot of cash. Despite this, defenders of the British system say that it makes sure only Unfortunately, it had disastrous consequences. The Shrewsbury and Telford tried to reduce their number of C-sections to zero, with the result that between 2000 and 2019, hundreds of babies were left stillborn or with permanent brain damage, fractured skulls, and other complications from forced delivery. At least 12 mothers died in childbirth, and had they gotten C-sections, they'd still be alive. Their families spent years campaigning to try and get this investigated. There were inquiries and reviews which the Trust fought every step of the way, but eventually the truth came out. The Royal College of Midwives has now officially apologised and accepted that its position on C-sections was not based on the medical evidence. The President of the Royal College of Obstetricians has also formally apologised, and the Shrewsbury and Telford Trust has paid out £58 million in damages and counting. The reason I tell this story is because it shows that no matter how bad things get, it is possible to address it. We can't bring back the people who died or undo the suffering. But the NHS can and does face up to its mistakes. And if they can look for the natural birth scan, then they can do it for us. One thing that would be good be if there was some kind of inquiry or truth commission set up to look at the issues we raised today. Somewhere where the people who are denied health care and the families of the ones who died had a chance to tell their story. Something a bit more formal than the lady in city costumes makes a video essay. It would be nice too if that inquiry featured a majority of trans people on its governing body. There have been NHS reports into this sort of thing before, but uh, they tend to be, oh, cis people have investigated themselves and they did nothing wrong. The report from that inquiry will then give us a nice place to start talking about material changes, like apologies, resignations, changing the system, memorials, damages, public executions, that sort of thing. It would be cool if GPs got some training in trans medicine. The RCGP recommended that years ago, so it would be great if they actually got around to it. There's lots of people who benefit from that sort of thing, actually. People who have endometriosis or who go through menopause have a really hard time getting GPs to listen to them. So if doctors actually knew a little bit more about the communities they're meant to be helping, as well as you know, tackling prejudice in the workforce, that sort of thing would be really helpful too. Decriminalizing testosterone might also help. A lot of people do have to resort to staff medication when the NHS fails them, so a harm reduction approach would probably do a lot of good there. That's not something the NHS could do on their own. It would require political pressure to bring that. My dad suggested that I write to my MP about all this, so at the time of recording, I have sent my MP 19 emails, 12 phone calls, and one handwritten letter, all of which she has completely ignored. I got a campaign leaflet through my letterbox the other day, and like, hey, I'm going to vote for me at the next election, and I was like, babes, you should book yourself a little bit External pressure could also be brought through the courts. Whenever I talk about this subject, Americans always tell me, you should launch a class action lawsuit, which sounds great, but sadly it doesn't really exist in England. The NHS is currently being sued by four trans people, though. That's why Chaplain Tapman was ordered to drop my case. His superiors say he can't do anything that might affect the outcome. At time of recording, the case is scheduled to be heard any day now and it could have major ramifications. At the end of the day, the big solution is the one that's been staring the NHS in the face for years, the one we've been asking for for years, the one that other countries already do, an informed consent system. I actually said this to Colonel Capcom directly. I said, hey, why not just close the gender clinics? Get rid of the waiting list entirely. Let us get our healthcare the same way everyone else does. I mean, we, don't, we don't need a doctor's permission to change our bodies, right? That's, that's bodily autonomy 101. So, I mean, everyone agrees the system is bad. So, you're going to change the system.
aren't you? And Colonel Cathcart said, yes, I agree. Things do need to change. That's why I have a plan. A plan to change the system. In 2020, NHS England commissioned a new pilot scheme called Trans Plus here in London. It's a sexual health clinic and a gender identity clinic rolled into one. And this is Colonel Cathcart's baby. He told me so himself. He wants this to be the future of trans healthcare in England. There are more clinics like it on the way. Patients and activists have been campaigning for years to get something done. And it's possible that this might represent a slight improvement at some point in the future. But still have way too much power. It's still out of step with what other countries are doing. It's still a massive, unnecessary, expensive layer to the system. Patients still have no control over what happens to us. And this is the bit that really gets me. He wants us to just forget about all the horrible things that have happened. Sarah Ahmed talks about how institutions have their own relationships to time. What philosophers call temporality. When you make a complaint, you look back at the harm that was done. But in all my conversations with NHS senior officers, they only want to look forward. They don't want to look back at the warnings they were given, at the promises they made, at the harm that was done. But especially, they don't want to look back at the people who died as a result of their decisions, or the people who were permanently made to be impacted. It's nice nice that they want to open more clinics at some point but what about the people who need health care now what about the people who are dead even if we are not the ones who survived tens of thousands of people were kept waiting and suffering needlessly for years they knew about it and did nothing they're still suffering this is still happening people's lives are being destroyed by this system and they f***ing matter Fixing anything. Not even an apology. I'm the person making the complaint. 